Well, good morning and happy new year to you. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at the Church of the Resurrection on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. We're so pleased that you've joined us this Sunday as we celebrate a new year and we celebrate the dawning of God's light in Christ, which goes forth to all nations. Please join me now in the opening acclamation. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation, salvation may reach to the end of the earth. earth. And now join me in this prayer for purity in worship. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this time, stand as you are able and join us in ringing in this new year with song. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more that sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. I invite you now to kneel or be seated as you are able, and let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God, first in silence and then aloud together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, 
confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand once again and hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to follow Jesus. God set the stars to give light to the world. The star of my life is Jesus. In Him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. I want to see the brightness of God. I want to look at Jesus. Clear sun of righteousness shine on my path and show me the way to the Father. In Him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. Gloria, 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 in excelsis, Deo, 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 Gloria, 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 in excelsis.
Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria, Gloria, Gloria. In excelsis Deo, Deo, Deo. South Carolina with my family. I've been attending Res for seven years. Please join us in the collect of the day. O oh God, by the leading of a star, you manifested your only Son to the peoples of the earth. Lead us, who know you now by faith, to your presence, where we may see your glory face to face. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, my name is Kristen Price. I live in the 8th Street neighborhood, and I've been attending Res for about 10 years. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is Isaiah 60, 1 through 9. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant, your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you, the wealth of the nations shall come to you, a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and I will beautify my beautiful house. Who are these that fly like a cloud, and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall hope for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from afar, their silver and gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Howdy, we are the Roberts. I'm Johnny and this is Ari. We've been attending Res for a little over three years now, and uh, we live uh, just north of Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Today we will be reading Psalm chapter 72, verses 1 through 11. We'll be reading responsively by whole verse. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures, and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish, and peace abound till the moon be no more. May he have dominion from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him, and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. 
May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and and ever ever shall be, world world without without end. end. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament lesson is from Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Feast of Epiphany will be this Wednesday, January 6th, but we're celebrating early today, and I trust that this is providential as we get going on all those New Year's resolutions, because the Epiphany story is meant to challenge us, our priorities, in light of the good news of Jesus. Not to say that New Year's resolutions are silly or bad, I'm all for New Year's resolutions, But simply, we often don't give due consideration to what God would have us decide and choose to do in the year ahead. In addition to eating right and giving up smoking and attending to the Zen of Inbox Zero and all those other things that we want to get to, what does God want for us in 2021? Epiphany challenges us in a good way with gospel priorities. Epiphany celebrates the coming of the Magi to worship Jesus, as we've heard in today's Gospel reading. In the Christian calendar, Epiphany is to Advent and Christmas what Pentecost is to Lent and Easter. It's the climactic grand finale of what began back around Thanksgiving with the season of Advent. After four weeks of waiting in the darkness, we celebrated the dawning of the light of Christ at the Feast of the Nativity, or Christmas. And now we're in the midst of these 12 days of feasting until Epiphany, when, we, when as we heard in Matthew 2, the newborn Messiah makes first contact with the Gentiles. It marks the dawn of the light of Christ shining to all nations. So not only is Epiphany, like Pentecost, in culminating a long season of feasting, But it's also like Pentecost in its literally pivotal role in the church, turning us outward with the good news that we have been celebrating within. Pentecost empowers the church to carry the good news of Jesus' resurrection on Easter out to all of the nations. And Epiphany empowers the church and calls the church to shine the light of Christmas throughout the world. Epiphany is especially important this year, I think, because we've been suffering for so many months with so many lives lost during the pandemic and our own lives turned upside down. Suffering naturally turns us inward. That's okay. That's that's the right thing. We need to heal and grieve and recover. Yet we're in the midst of a global catastrophe right now and we who are able to help in the relief have work to do. In addition to the vaccine, our suffering world is in urgent need of the epiphany of our Lord Jesus. Our neighbors groping in the darkness need to behold his magnificent brightness. 
Despite our own suffering, we who know Jesus have a priceless treasure in his light. As the children sing, we mustn't hide it under a bushel or let Satan blow it out. We have to let it shine. And so that's what we're about today. As we look at Matthew 2, 1 through 12 together, and I really encourage you to get out a Bible and open it up and to follow along with me because we'll carefully look at the text together. And as we prepare to do so, I want to invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you so much for your word. It is a privilege to turn to it together, to read it and to have our hearts transformed by it. We're so thankful for the good news of Epiphany. We pray that your light would shine in us and your light would shine through us. Now fill us with your spirit that we would understand what you have to say to us and that we might believe and follow your son. We pray in his name, amen. So Matthew chapter two, verse one reads this way. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. You know Epiphany's most famous hymn, and it's misleading in a couple of the most important details. We three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar. And actually, the Bible doesn't really tell us how many magi came when they came. There could have been three, there could have been two, there could have been 200, it doesn't say. All we know is what we find here in chapter 2, verse 1 of Matthew, that magi, plural, came from the east to Jerusalem. And they weren't kings in the ordinary or normal way we think about kings. The Greek word magi is ancient and mysterious. It describes something more like philosophers, sages, rather than rulers of any kingdoms. There is, however, a Greek word for king, and in fact, Matthew uses that word three times here at the beginning of the Epiphany story in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. So in a different sense, this is a three kings story. Look again at verse 1 to see Matthew's first mention of a king in the normal sense of the word. He says, Jesus was born in the days of Herod the king. Matthew's first mention of a king is with regard to Herod the Great, who ruled Palestine with an iron fist at the time of Jesus' birth. Herod was a tyrannical despot. He levied heavy taxes against the people for his massive building projects. He lived extravagantly on the backs of many, many slaves, and he killed anyone who was a threat to his reign, including his wife, his mother-in-law, his brother-in-law, and at least three of his sons. At his death, according to the historian Josephus, Herod commanded a large group of the nobility to be rounded up and executed. And Matthew goes on to tell us later, in this chapter, at the end of chapter 2, that Herod took a similar approach with the sons of Bethlehem in an attempt to exterminate any would-be messiahs. But here in chapter 2, verse 1, at least at the outset, Matthew makes no explicit assessment of Herod the Great, either good or bad. All he has to say about Herod is that he was a king, which is all that really needs to be said, because you can only have one. As I mentioned, verse 1 is the first of three occurrences of this word king here at the beginning of the Epiphany story. Now look at verse 2 in which the Magi ask about another king. They ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? I love what Matthew is doing here as a historian and a storyteller. It's subtle and it's brilliant. The same word that he used to describe Herod as king, he now uses to describe someone else who's not Herod, someone unrelated to Herod, whom we will discover is Jesus. Both Herod and Jesus are simply the king. Yet everybody knows that there can only be one king. So, as Acacia says, the plot thickens. And just in case we missed what Matthew was doing here, he throws in the word king a third time in verse 3. Take a look. He says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. It's not like there were a lot of Herods in the story. And Matthew had to clarify that he was talking about not this Herod or that Herod, but Herod the king. 
No, there's only one Herod, the one that he's already described as king in verse 1. But apparently, according to the Magi, now there's another king in verse 2. And not only Herod, the king in verse 3, but all Jerusalem are now alarmed by this news. Because again, the fundamental rule of monarchy is that you can't have more than one king. In case you don't understand this rule, just ask Herod's remaining surviving relatives, the ones who haven't been executed by him by this point. Now, all this happened very long ago, and thankfully, many things have changed since the tyranny of Herod the Great. But even now, in our great democracy, one thing hasn't changed, and that is that the people at the top will do anything to keep from losing control. And though it sounds like I'm talking about national politics right now, I'm not at all. I'm talking about you and me. We were born to rule under God, but we have writhed and twisted and wiggled out from his sovereign goodness in order to take matters into our own hands. And when anybody else comes along who is a threat to our own sovereignty, we will do whatever it takes to neutralize them. Believe it or not, that's what Matthew's gospel is all about from start to finish. It's ultimately the story of who will be king in our lives. We're the third king in this story, actually. There's Herod, there's Jesus, and then there's you and me. But you can't have more than one king. And so again, the plot thickens. It gets thickerer. Look at what Herod and Jerusalem did when they heard of this new challenger to the throne. First, in verse, verses 4 through 6, they had a Bible study. Hmm. Everybody, come on, get out your Bibles, and let's see what God's holy word can tell us about the coming of the Messiah. Look here in verse uh, five, chapter 5 of Micah. It says that there's a ruler who will come and shepherd Israel, and he will be born in Bethlehem. Okay, now what should we do? Does it say? No? Well, then, okay, because we all know what to do with such people. Herod has a plan for what to do. In verses 7 and 8, Herod summoned the Magi and sent them to Bethlehem in order to find the Messiah and return with the Messiah's coordinates. Why did Herod want this information? He says to worship him just like he worshiped his wife and his sons. We know what he intends. Now, can you imagine doing this? Can you imagine having a Bible study and digging into it to find out what it says and then not only determining to take the opposite course from what it says, but lying about your intentions? Again, as much as times have changed, our fallen human nature hasn't changed at all, has it? All our problems can be traced back to disobeying God and then evading him or lying about it. Adam and Eve did it. Herod the Great did it. We still do it today. So Herod the Great, a man in his 70s probably at this point, the most powerful person in all Palestine, set into motion this dastardly plan to destroy the infant Jesus because he perceived this infant to be an immediate threat to his reign. And from what we can tell, the Magi fell for it. Verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way to Bethlehem, presumably to find Jesus and then to, to disclose his whereabouts to Herod. Don't you love the suspense in this story? The way that Matthew tells it, it it's actually the same from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 28. It feels throughout like there's this real contest for who is going to be king at the end of the story. For example, if we were to just rewind one episode before this one, Mary the Virgin got pregnant and Joseph, her betrothed, is all set to divorce her. But then in chapter 1, verse 20, an angel of the Lord appears at just the last moment, tells Joseph what's happening, and Joseph decides to take Mary as his wife. And whew, 
that everything is okay, everything is saved and moving forward. Then we have this story that we're reading today. Today's episode, Herod lays this trap for Jesus and the, magi, the magi appear to fall for it. But then in verse 12, they're warned in a dream not to return to Herod. So Jesus survives, Whew, another close call. And then verse 13, Joseph has another dream. An angel tells him again, to flee with Mary and Jesus, get down to Egypt fast. Why? Because Herod's now trying to massacre all of the sons of Bethlehem in search of the Messiah. So once again, Jesus barely escapes and survives another close call. And on and on and on it goes throughout Matthew's gospel as if there is a real con contest between the various kings and rulers of the day, whether Herod or the next Herod or the next Herod or Pilate or the Pharisees, all contesting with Jesus, the Messiah. But if you step back and you take a look at what's happening overall in these stories and what they have in common, there's never really any contest at all, is there? In fact, what these show us is that in all of the universe, there is only one whose power is absolute. In all of Matthew's stories, Almighty God is at work behind the scenes to ensure that nothing happens to Jesus. There's never any real threat from these earthly kings. The only possible question is whether Satan himself will somehow succeed in the wilderness to convince Jesus to rebel against his father, just as he did with Adam and Eve. But even then, Jesus easily dismisses every temptation that Satan throws at him. And so Matthew's story of Jesus describes one victory after another after another over Herod and demons and disease and hunger and injustice. With the Father on his side, nothing can stop Jesus until, of course, the cross. But even when Good Friday comes and Jesus is tried by a kangaroo court, and mercilessly mocked and beaten and then executed by torture, there's nevertheless an overwhelming sense that this too was somehow according to plan. It was the cup of wrath for the rebellion of the whole world that Jesus willingly drank for us. He chose to do it. The disciples may have been surprised by what happened at the cross, but only because they hadn't been listening to Jesus, who's been talking about this from the beginning and towards the end explicitly says three times what's about to happen. Yet all the way to the end, the entire story continues to be about who is the king. Matthew 27, verse 11, Jesus stood before Pilate, the governor, who asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Verse 29 of chapter 27, twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, hail king of the Jews. Verse 37, and over his head, they put a charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Verse 42, mockingly, they shouted, he is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Would they? Would they believe in him? His entire life has been one miraculous escape after another after another, and they haven't believed in him yet. So why would they believe him now if he escaped once more, this time from crucifixion? By the way, it's important to understand what the Bible means when it says believe in Jesus. It's not mere agreement that Jesus existed, as if when kids say, I believe in Santa Claus, or I believe in the Easter Bunny. From the Bible's perspective, to believe in Jesus is to give him your allegiance, to declare him to be your king. And it reminds us, once again, of the fundamental rule of monarchies, which is that there ain't room in the universe for me and you, Jesus, unless you are willing to get in this little compartment and say hi when I visit you on Sundays. If not, you're going to have to die. So that's in fact what Jesus did. He died for us, for our rebellion, for our pious Bible study from which we decide 
ways to kill him, for our believing in him without obeying him, for our worship of him, by which we mean to kill him. He died for us to rescue us from all of these things. And if you're tired of all of the fighting and compartmentalization and deception, then he welcomes you to do what the Magi did. They knew better. They knew about Herod the Great, but they didn't leave their homes and families and jobs behind and travel at great expense for half a year to see Herod. When they arrived in Jerusalem, verse 2, they didn't ask for Herod. They asked for the Messiah King, the one their ancestors had heard about from Jonah and from Daniel. When Herod summoned them to the palace, verse 7, the Magi didn't rejoice and worship him, nor did they lay out their treasures before him. They merely listened. Verse 9, and then they went on their way. In verse 10, when they saw his star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. This was the moment that they had been waiting for, that they had been marching over hills and mountains and valleys to come to meet him. All those days, the great day that their ancestors had long been watching the stars to discern, and it overwhelmed them with joy. When they arrived, verse 11, they fell down before Jesus and did what Herod should have done and what everyone in the world should do. They worshiped him, laying their magnificent treasures before him. The best gifts that they had fit for a king. The Magi knew what was the best choice. They tied their time and treasure to him. Leaving everything else behind, they took a year off to find and worship Jesus. And then they gave him their very best. And that's what it means to believe in Jesus. If you haven't yet bowed before him in this way, laying down before him your best, laying down before him your time, your talents, and your treasures, then this should be at the very top of your list for 2021. There's nothing more important to do this year. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Bow before him and give him everything. For this is truly what it means to believe in him. And there can be only one king. And this epiphany, let the light of Christ shine through you like never before. Our world, darkened by sin, is now in the throes of a terrible plague that has struck 80 million people around the world. The world needs an epiphany of King Jesus, which, by the way, he commanded us to give them. Because as Matthew tells us, at the end of his story, the baby Jesus grew up to be our Savior. On the cross, he set aside his crown in order to ransom us from slavery. But God, glory to God, in the highest, he raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus didn't die forever. On the third day, he rose from the grave and he summoned his disciples to the mountain in Galilee, where he assured them of his supremacy as king, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you get going with your New Year's resolutions, no more of this nonsense about trying to kill me. I'm undestroyable. You can't win. And no more compartmentalization. I'm bigger than any box you try to put me in. Here's what I want you to do, and believe me, nothing will be more satisfying in the year ahead. Do this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So add this to your resolutions. Put this at the very top. Who will you pray for? Who will you tell? I love the Greek word in this story for treasures. It's the word thesaurus. 
And I love to think about this every time this year, every, uh, this time every year. The greatest treasure we have is our words to share with others, the words of the good news of Jesus. Who will you tell? How will you tell them? Make a plan. Tell others in the church, share this with them. It's almost always better to go two by two. It's almost always better to have others on your team. Tell others about the Lord and invite them into the light of Christ. This year, don't hide it under a bushel. Don't let Satan blow it out. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let's pray. Lord, may your light shine through us like never before. You have blessed us immeasurably with the good news of Jesus. Fill us with joy and send us out with this good news to share with others and see them come to know you in the year ahead. For we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As with gladness men of old did the guiding star behold, as with joy they hailed its light, leading onward beaming bright. So most gracious Lord may we evermore be led to As with joyful steps they sped To that lowly manger bed There to bend the knee before Him whom heaven and earth adore So may we with willing feet Ever seek thy mercy seat us every day keep us in the narrow way and when earthly things are past bring our ransom souls at last where they need no star to guide where no clouds thy glory hide where they need no star to guide where no clouds thy glory hide. Hey there, we're the Feinberg family. My name is Evan, Sarah, Jake, Luke, Zach. We are from Alexandria, Virginia, and we've been attending Church of the Resurrection for between five and about 14 years. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, and Stephen Breedlove, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For, for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service especially our president, Donald Trump, our president-elect, Joe Biden, our mayor, Muriel Bowser, and governors, Larry Hogan of Maryland and Ralph Northam of Virginia. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life, in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. 
I invite you to add your own petitions as you're led. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As Christ our Savior has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father, who art who are in, in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as and we forgive those, those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Forever, forever and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. Hi, we're Carl and Cheryl Nielsen. We live in the Hill East neighborhood of Washington, D.C. We've been attending Res for about seven years. Please join us in making a confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We, we believe, believe in, in one God, God the, the Father, Father, the Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Greet one another in the peace of Christ. You know, as we've been doing throughout our many months now of online worship, we're encouraging you to uh, send a greeting of peace to someone that you may, ha may not have seen or talked to in a while. Text message, a phone call, an email. Few announcements to bring to you as we start this new year. Tonight is our newcomers gathering uh, that we've been doing once a month. It's at seven o'clock. You can reach out today to our director of administration, Tinbeat, and she would be happy to send you a link. Also, if you are brand new with us, this is the first time you've tuned in or, or you haven't made any contact with us, there is a little button on our website that says, I am new. And that's a great place to start if you're not quite ready to come to the newcomers gathering, although we'd love to have you, fill out that, that form. Basically, it allows us to get your contact information and to send you some details that you'd like to have about the church, different ministries that we have, ways for you to get involved. We'd love to hear from you and to know you're there. We'd love to pray for you, so please do make contact with us. There are a couple of other uh, buttons on the website that you'll want to take note of. We have a Res 911 button, and this is basically a care form where you or maybe people you know can reach out to the church to get help. So this could be help for uh, a need, a financial need, or a material need, or also just needing help with prayer or someone to talk to. Uh, fill that form out and we will get in touch with you and see if we can help in any way. Um, and then there's a form as well, another form uh, with the volunteer button. You can fill out that form if you're someone who wants to be ready and willing to, to offer assistance to others as needs arise. A few other things. We continue to have Monday to Friday morning prayer on Zoom. It's 8 a.m. to 8.30. 
And the group is looking at a selection of uh, scriptural passages with a short Bible study, but most of the time is dedicated to prayer. And it's a great way to stay connected to others and to stay connected to God uh, during these times. So go on our website. There's a Zoom link there, and you can join us uh, at any time you want. There's also res groups continue to meet uh, online at this current time. If you're interested in getting connected to a group of people uh, to meet with for prayer and Bible study in an, on an evening, please reach out to me. My details are on the website, and I'd love to help you find a group. During this time in our service is, is the moment where we usually uh, take up our offering. And we do this because we believe that worship is an act of offering ourselves our whole selves to God. And that includes giving to him from the material resources that he has blessed us with. So this is part of an act of worship. Well, we're not taking up an offering in our live services or of course online, but there is a give button on the website. We continue to encourage you to worship the Lord through your giving and continue to support the ministry of the gospel in our city as well. Please stand with me now as we sing our final hymn. Go tell it on the mountains, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go. Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed a Savior's birth. Go tell it on. Christ is born. Down in a lonely manger, the humble Christ was born, and God sent a salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on a mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on a mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Well, it's been great worshiping with you this morning, thinking about light to the world, light to the Gentiles. And uh, let me leave you now with this blessing, this benediction. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. All of our hopes we set on the risen Christ. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.